Greetings in the name of Christ, everyone. Welcome to this video service for the second Sunday in Lent, February 28th, 2021. A few announcements to make. First of all, welcome to anyone who's joining us, whether you're a member of Nakuchi Presbyterian Church or a friend or just someone who happened upon us. We're glad you've joined us this day. One main announcement to make, the session decided, as was announced last week, the session decided that we will continue to suspend public worship and continue worship in this manner for the month of March. I do want to assure you that the session is well aware that April the 4th is Easter Sunday and we are considering, though we do not know yet how, uh, to make that a special celebration. It's possible that it would be just this. Uh, it's possible we'll just have a, a more extensive video service for Easter Sunday, but it's also possible that there'll be some other uh, way forward, but I don't know what it will be. Just know that we're thinking about it. Um, with that said, let me say to you that even though we are not together, my heart, my mind extends to you the peace of Jesus Christ. The peace of Jesus Christ. La paz de Cristo se con ustedes. The peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. La gracia de Cristo se con todos ustedes. The grace of Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Adoramos a Dios. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Hope beyond all human hope. You promised descendants as numerous as the stars to old Abraham and Sarah. You promise light and salvation in the midst of darkness and despair and promise redemption to a world that will not listen. Gather us to yourself in tenderness. Open our ears to listen to your word and teach us to live faithfully as people confident of the fulfillment of your promises. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ and let God's people say, Amen. Our opening hymn of praise is number 49 in the hymnal. The words will appear on your screen, The God of Abraham Praise. Let us sing together. Yeah. 
trusting God's love to be our strength and stay. Let us confess our sins first with the unison prayer that will appear on your screen, followed by the singing of Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy upon us. Let us pray together. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us, by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from all our offenses, and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayers, and let us say together, Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ lived for us, Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that we are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. I invite the children to join me for the word with the children. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope you're doing taking care of yourself and wearing a mask, washing your hands and trying to stay out of big crowds as much as you can. I want to talk a little bit about leading and following. There's a story in the Bible I'm going to read in a little bit where Jesus is talking about what he's got to go do. And he's basically telling the disciples that they need to follow him. But Peter doesn't want to go where Jesus is leading, leading him and them. And so Peter tries to tell Jesus, no, you cannot do that. I'm not going to, I don't want you to do that. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me. You follow me. So I want to talk. Okay, you're going to have to imagine. You know what it means to imagine? You sort of, how do you describe that? Imagine you think something that's not exactly real, but I want you to imagine that I'm Jesus. And I know that's a hard imagination, but imagine that I'm Jesus. That's why I'm like, Jesus was a good shepherd. That's why I'm wearing, walking with this. And Jesus is leading, and I want you to imagine that Peter and the other disciples are behind Jesus, following where he leads. So Jesus is walking, and he says, follow me i got to go do some hard stuff. And Peter says, wait a minute. Peter says, no, 
You cannot go do that. So in other words, Peter wants to edge out Jesus and get out in front and take the staff and start leading everybody. And Jesus says, Peter, get behind me and you go where I lead. And Peter does. But it was a hard day. Hard lesson for Peter. You know, in our lives, we can be leaders sometimes, and we can be followers sometimes. Both, it's fine to be a leader and a follower. If you're following, make sure the person you're following is leading you in the direction of love and kindness and generosity toward other people. If you're leading people, you lead in that direction too, love and kindness. Don't follow people who are leading you in the direction of bad things. And that's what Jesus was saying. Follow me, Peter, because I'm going to lead you in the direction of God's love. So let's follow Jesus. Let's have a prayer. God, we thank you for these children. We love them so. And we thank you for Jesus who leads the way. In his name we pray. And let all God's children say, Amen. Bye, everybody. The first reading comes from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 and 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, you are my strength. Hasten to help me. Lord, you are my strength, hasten to help me. Praise the Lord, you that are God-fearing. Stand in awe of the Lord, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line give glory. For the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. Lord, you are my strength. Hasten to My praises of God in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall give praise. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to God, and all the families of the nations shall bow before the Lord. 
for sovereignty belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Lord, you are my strength. Hasten to help me. To the Lord alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before the Lord. My soul shall live for God. My descendants shall serve the Lord. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that God has done. Lord, you are my strength. Hasten to help me. A couple of Sundays ago, that was, which was Transfiguration Sunday, we read the Gospel from Mark chapter 9, and that passage began with six days Later, And I told you during that sermon that it was six days after Jesus told the disciples what was going to happen to him and how that must have been a difficult six days. Well, this is the passage that was, that was referred to when, when the passage began six days later. This is six days earlier from the transfiguration. It's from Mark chapter 8, beginning with verse 31. Then he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said this all quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when He comes in the glory of His Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. Years, years ago, many years ago now, it was before Fred Craddock died in 2015, I spent a day in Cherry Log, Georgia, at the Cherry Log Christian Church, listening to Dr. Craddock teaching. He was leading a workshop entitled Preaching the Cross of Christ. It was held just a few weeks before this passage would appear in the Sunday readings the workshop was held under the auspices of this newly formed Craddock Center, so named by the people of Cherry Log Christian Church, and it was free. Not only was the program free, but they provided breakfast and lunch for all of us who were in attendance. It was hardly uh, any kind of sacrifice for me to, to be there, a 90-minute drive over the mountain on a pretty day, that's what it was. Fred Craddock was at the time recently retired and quite popular. There was nothing in this for him financially, and no one would fault him if he decided to spend his retirement on his porch. But there he was, all five foot four of him, and he did not even sell books. In fact, he was giving a number of his library books away to anyone who wanted them. I suppose Fred Craddock and all the people of the Craddock Center gave of themselves to put on this conference for me and the others who showed up. It was, it was not free to them. 
But it was free to us, and I came home with this sermon. I took a few notes, impressions really, of what Dr. Craddock was saying, and I reviewed those notes for this sermon. Don't hold the late, great Dr. Fred Craddock accountable for what you are about to hear. I am not a great note taker, never have been. When and if I learn something, it starts by me really listening and then afterwards jotting a few things down. I've been this way since college. No one ever wanted to borrow my notes from class, and for good reason. More blank paper than notes. Maybe, however, by the time we get to the end of this sermon, your thinking on the meaning of the cross will be stimulated, as mine was years ago. If not, well, it's probably my fault or yours, but not Fred Craddock's. Right out of the shoot at this conference, I was brought to attention by Dr. Craddock's initial statement. He said, there are those who make too much of the cross. What do you mean there are those who make too much of the cross, I'm thinking? How could anyone make too much of the cross? He went on to say that often people use the cross to justify violence, as an excuse for war, as an attitude toward people in pain needing to bear up under that pain without complaint. People use the image of the cross to say that violence can be redemptive. And the cross then becomes a cover for engaging in aggressions. People, said Fred Craddock, can make too much of the cross. And after hearing him, I agreed. Dr. Craddock also said that it's possible to make too little of the cross. The architect of one of the grand mega churches in California brags about the fact that no cross is found in the building. We don't want any crosses on the church, either outside or inside, he said. None. We don't want anybody to think failure and weakness. Why would we want a symbol of a man slumped dead on a cross after his few friends have gotten out of Dodge. All that were left were only a few women crying. You talk about weakness. What does that do? I remember a quotation from a Craddock sermon that I have where he quotes Philip Reif at the University of Chicago. Philip Reif said, Any church or preacher who keeps preaching on the cross is not going to grow. The preacher will not be a success and the church will not grow because in our culture what we are interested in is success, not sacrifice. Craddock doesn't agree with this. He said it is possible to make too little of the cross. Here's the overarching umbrella of what Fred Craddock was saying about the cross from a biblical standpoint, this is a bit like a, a Bible lesson. He said something along the lines of, the cross means different things to different writers in the New Testament. We tend, most of us, we tend only to hear Paul because the cross is so central to Paul's understanding of the meaning of Jesus. But Paul's understanding of the cross, which is powerful and important, is not the only one in the Bible. For Paul, the cross is about bearing sins. Jesus takes our sins upon Himself that we might be made righteous through faith in Jesus. Jesus is the perfect Lamb sacrificed for sins. Jesus is the scapegoat that gets driven into the desert bearing our sins, the sins of humanity. Jesus and His death on the cross for Paul is a bearing of the curse of human sinfulness. That is Paul's understanding of the cross. Luke, however, talks more about repentance than any other New Testament writer. The cross is not about Jesus bearing the sins of the world, as with Paul, there's no theory of atonement in Luke. Rather, the cross represents what had to happen to Jesus because of what is said in the law, the prophets, the Psalms. For Luke, continuity with Judaism is very important. Jesus suffers because prophets suffer. 
Jesus suffers because anger and fear were projected upon him. Like a pumpkin on a post receiving the arrows of our anger, Jesus received our violence. His righteousness and justice brought forth the dark passions of those around him. The emphasis in Luke is the resurrection and ascension, God's yes to living the way Jesus lived, to taking up the cross daily. The cross, therefore, in Luke is a way of living day by day by day, not a one-time event of a great sacrifice for the sins of the world. Now for the gospel writer John, the cross is the means by which Jesus gets back to God. Jesus in John is always filled with glory. His life and his death speak of Jesus' oneness with God. In John, Jesus, in John, Jesus is rarely troubled or agitated. He is fully aware of what is happening and he's, for the most part, he's serene about it all. The cross is where Jesus is lifted up and glorified. And when He is lifted up and glorified, He will then send the Holy Spirit that will lead people into all truth. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the grand good news of the cross for John. After Jesus is lifted up, the Father will send an even greater gift, the Holy Spirit. The blood of the cross is like the Passover lamb that allows the people to be led into the promised land of liberation that comes with the gift of the Spirit. Now Fred Craddock's advice to us, those of us gathered listening to him at this workshop, was to preach the cross as it comes to us in the text we are using. He advised advised us not to preach and think in one way about what the cross means, but to take our cue from the gospel writers from which we are preaching. I was sitting there hoping he would talk about the cross in Mark. He did not. Like the professor he was, Dr. Craddock knew we would leave and have to go preach on the cross in Mark but he left us to go figure that out. What does the cross mean in Mark? He left us with that work to do. So, (laughs) what is Mark's understanding of the cross? Jesus told the disciples that he, quote, and I'm quoting here, he must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, chief priests and the scribes, be killed, and after three days rise again. He said it openly, Peter rebuked Jesus, Jesus rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan, for you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For Mark, unlike John, Jesus was very human. He was truly tempted by Peter's alluring suggestion that he avoid the cross. Why else would Jesus have responded so strongly by calling his good friend Satan? Jesus was truly struggling with what it meant to live into His calling. Unlike John, where Jesus is always serene, fully aware of the oneness with God, Mark's Jesus was tempted. He was agitated and distressed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He quoted from the cross, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, by the way, Jesus uh, quoted another psalm in John. I'll leave that one for you to find. Not right now. Well, you could. Pause me. Go find it. But come back. At the very least, we can say that for Mark, bearing the cross was hard. It was a sacrifice. Dr. Craddock told a story. It was almost, for Dr. Craddock, it was almost offhanded. I bet he didn't write it down in his notes. The story stuck with me and actually has continued to trouble me. In a Greek class that Dr. Craddock was teaching, there was a very good student. The student's assignment was to translate Romans 9, where Paul is speaking about his anguish over the Jews. Paul said in Romans 9, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, 
For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred, according to the flesh. Dr. Craddock said there was something troubling about this student, this good student's translation and presentation. His translation was perfect and smooth. He got the words just right. But something was missing. Dr. Craddock asked him to stay after class. Dr. Craddock said, tell me about that passage. You did a good job in translation, but tell me about it. The student said, Paul was not very professional. You should not get so close to people that you are serving because you lose your perspective. Paul, he said, was unprofessional. Years later, Dr. Craddock was speaking somewhere and he was staying in that same student's home. Craddock's former student had, had not gone into the ministry, but had gone into business and had become very successful. Dr. Craddock said he was very hospitable to him, and later in the evening the man said, Well, I guess you're going to ask me about that Greek class. Dr. Craddock said, No, I wasn't going to ask. The man said, I couldn't do it. Couldn't become a minister. Too much is expected of ministers. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get that close to people. That story lingers in my heart and my head. Maybe what Mark is saying to us, what Jesus is saying to us by the cross, is that we are called to care. We are called to have hearts that anguish over the brokenness of humanity. We are not to grow indifferent or numb to the pains of humanity and, and God's good creation gone wrong. We are not to maintain a professional distance from the sins and sufferings of our brothers and sisters in the world. Rather, we are called to lose ourselves in caring and service of others. We are called to take up our cross and follow Jesus. It was, it was no sacrifice for me to attend that continuing education event at the Craddock Center. It reminded me, however, particularly in the remembrance of it, that day by day, people do make sacrifices for other people. All those folks at the Christian church made sacrifices for me that I might learn something from Dr. Craddock. The day reminded me that sacrifices, sacrifices are by definition not easy. Part of me, and I suspect part of you, wants to avoid making sacrifices. Jesus, however, invites us to see that wholeness Wholeness of life is gained by losing one's life day by day by day. Go figure. Let us pray. Beloved friends, in this season of repentance and healing, we accept God's invitation to be ever mindful of the needs of others, offering our prayers on behalf of God's community in the church and in the world. In our prayers this day, let us remember Martha Shannon, who is preparing for hip surgery, hip replacement on March the 10th. Continue to pray for Bill Owen, who had surgery on February 25th. Wally Jordan, who is doing better and recovering at home from heart issues. Kathy Metters and her daughter Dawn, her daughter Dawn having medical issues. Continue pray, praying for Richard and Jimmy Tinius, Bernice and Lisa Deaton. Also pray for Barney Powell, Marie Powell's brother, who is ill with heart issues, pneumonia, other health matters. 
Let us continue our prayers for government and health officials, for students, teachers, administrators, staff in our schools. And let us continue our prayers in silence or by speaking names, concerns, celebrations aloud. Hear us, O God, as we continue our prayer. Hear, O God, our silent remembrances of those who have died. Fill us, O God, with your strength to resist the seductions of foolish desires and the tempter's vain delights, that we may walk in obedience and righteousness, rejoicing in you with an upright heart, and let God's people say, Amen. At this time, we invite your gifts to Nakuchi Presbyterian Church. You may give by way of Mailing a check to the P.O. Box 87, Salty Nacucci, Georgia, 30571. You may bring a check by. You may go online to our website and make an ongoing gift there or a one-time gift. But we invite your gifts to Nacucci Presbyterian Church.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of compassion, we praise you that you look upon our frail lives with love and understanding and that you desire for us all new life in Jesus Christ. We are overwhelmed by your love, which goes to the cross for us, endures the grave, leads us to new life. By your Spirit, strengthen our souls to be brave and bold in Christ's service. Take our offerings and use them and us for your purposes. In the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord, and let God's people say, Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of the family of God, let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our sending hymn in the hymnal is 726. The words will appear on your screen. It's, Will You Come and Follow Me, also known as the summons. You're invited to join in singing, Will You Come and Follow Me. Let us be watchful, stand firm in our faith, be courageous and strong. Let all that we do 
be done in love, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, communion of the Holy Spirit, be with us all. Amen.